Sukung Rawu. Selamat datang. Sekarjakan Rumian. The Industrial Revolution, the first industrial rev revolution in Britain, took the best part of 70 years. We have about 10 to 15 years to address the issue of global warming, to keep the temperature at 1.5 degrees centigrade. If we don't do that, you don't have a future on this planet. And as Emmanuel Macron said, there's no planet B. And as Stephen Hawking said before he died, you're not at the stage where you can colonize other planets. So everyone is in this together. Within 10 years, the default setting of all transport in all developed cities will be electrical. This is probably the last car you will ever own. So the revolution occurred in 18th century Britain. Britain was a very small community. At the beginning of the 18th century, it had 4.5 million people. That's about the size of where I live in western Jakarta and Tangerang. At the end of the 18th century, the beginning of the 19th, England had 9.1 million people. That's smaller than Jakarta. But at that time, it could become the workshop of the world, the leading commercial nation. When Britain was at the peak of its power, in just before the First World War, and had 130 times the area of its land size, under its imperial and colonial aegis, the size of the population was smaller than West Java. It was 43 million. West Java is 46 million. So the power of an industrial revolution can unlock a very important energies and the ability to project those energies. The Industrial Revolution starts with a revolutionary act, the cutting of the head of our king in 1649 during the Civil War and the triumph of Parliament over the Crown. Of parliamentary norms over royal prerogative. The first great reform was that of the judiciary. If you were a judge in 17th century England, you would be a country gentleman and you would be paid 20 pounds a year. You have here two people who sum up two different faces. One is very well known to you, Samuel Pepys. The other the younger brother of Jeremy Bentham is probably not well known to you. Both were secretaries to the Navy, a Navy which was a very key important part for Britain's ability to project its power globally. Pepys worked 24-7. He went blind in the service of the king. When he came into office, in the 1670s, he had about 200 pounds in his bank account. When he left, he had 7,000. He was deeply corrupt, but he justified that corruption by saying that he, he worked for the king, he gave the king everything that he could, and he did the best in terms of the supplies, and the support and the logistics for his task. The background to the Industrial Revolution was not only internal but external. Britain was taken over by Holland, taken over by a Dutch king who used the resources of Britain to fight a major continental conflict with France. And in the 18th century, great opportunities developed 
for earning money. A select few, like Warren Hastings, Governor of Bengal, Duke of Marlborough, the Commander of the Armies, became fabulously wealthy out of the opportunities which developed. It was in that century that a shift occurred in terms of particularly the textile industry. It is said that necessity is the mother of invention. If you have a small population, it is probably better than if you have a large population in terms of having to find means to be able to maximize output. A jacquard power loom working two hours could produce as much as a hand loom weaver in a year. So the change exponentially was huge. Britain also began to perfect the puddling process for steel and the development of a steel and iron industry. To your right is the boat which took Diponogoro from Samarang to Batavia, the SS van der Capella. You began to have a major revolution. To the left is Tanjung Pagar docks in Singapore. You began to have a major revolution in transport, not only by sea, but also on land. The ability to be able to move large numbers of people cheaply, which I experience every day now in Jakarta. If you look at relative levels of industrialization between 1750, Ingris Ungol, yeah? over Germany and the United States. By 1750, Britain had invested four million sterling in its infrastructure and its industry. It earned 3.8 million by 1750 from the slave trade. The British Industrial Revolution impoverished large swathes of the world. As I said, India's share declined. India's share of global industrial output declined from 25% to 2%, while the UK share of the world economy rose from just under 3% in 1700 to 9% in 1870. By 1870, Britain had replaced India as the world's largest textile manufacturer. The Industrial Revolution was also powered by a huge sense of fear of foreign invasion, subversion, and international disaster. Within seven short years, Britain lost 13 colonies in America due to ineptitude. This stunning loss of America led to economical reform in government, ending with the Great Reform Bill of 1832, and reform initiatives supported by utilitarian philosophies of the likes of Jeremy Bentham. The greatest happiness of the greatest number is the measure of right and wrong and also an evangelical revolution. There was a Revolution Mantal in Britain, which led to interesting changes within the elite. Here's Wesley, John Wesley, preaching to Parliament. The beginnings of proceedings against ministers, not because they stole, but because they acted corruptly, and the end of the slave trade. Here is an action which is not actually in the economic interests of the British elite, but which was carried out between 1807 and 1833. And a mental revolution sustained a 50-year cleaning of the Augean stables of the state, with ever harsher laws to reform corrupt practices in government and the political will to succeed. Also the beginning of the ability to guard your coastline against smuggling. Post-1832, there were still corrupt individuals in government, but they were the exception, not the rule. Corruption, corruption was no longer the default setting, or was it? Today, the UK is a deeply corrupt country, the worst offender when it comes to offshore tax havens, of which eight out of the 15, constituting 15% 15 of world GDP, is in, are in British hands. And now it is contemplating shipwreck as a result of Brexit 
and a deeply inept political elite who didn't give one single thought to Ireland and did this act of a referendum on the EU entirely to solve the problems of the Tory party. That is Britain's steep decline since the end of Bretton Woods and the end of the monetary and exchange rate management. Matona